Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So I will assume, of course, that everybody has already read this week's Torah portion of Chaye Sarah uh, at least two or three times. Uh, that, that is actually the ideal each week. Uh, uh, the, 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 the official phrase is to read it twice and once in translation. I'll let you read it all in translation, but it's not very long. But there is so much packed into it. I mean, like all of the sections of the Torah, but especially the book of Genesis. But the part I want to draw your attention to, and you can go back and check the text to uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the section <coughs> where Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, has gone back to Haran, uh, Abraham's uh, most recent address before he moved down to uh, the land of Israel, because he needs to find a bride for Isaac. It is time for Isaac to get married. And Eliezer, the servant, goes there, and as he is uh, preparing to look for the girl, he utters a, a prayer, or a test, or a statement. It depends how you wish to interpret his words. He says, let it be that the girl I ask at the well to uh, give me a drink of water will not only give me a drink of water, but will also offer to um, um, give water to all of my camels as well. He's looking for somebody uh, of great kindness, of great generosity, of great hospitality. He is looking essentially for a female Abraham. And uh, that makes a lot of sense since he respects Abraham greatly and would imagine that would make a good match for Isaac, who grew up in Abraham's house. Of course, the story plays out that who should be the one to come, but here is Rivka, Rebecca, and she uh, does everything that he asks. And he immediately uh, gives her the jewelry as a symbol of betrothal. He asks, where are you from? And she tells him that he, she is from uh, the house of Bethuel, which, wouldn't you know it, just so happens to be a relative of Abraham as well. So not only is she of the right spirit, she's even from the right family. Beautiful, perfect. And then he has to go meet her family. Uh, they're not so beautiful and perfect. Uh, but as he is talking with them, a careful read will show that, um, well, first of all, that he repeats the entire story for them. Now, we, the reader, might be left scratching our head. Why is he bothering to uh, tell us the story again when we just saw the story play out? Why is the Torah bothering to repeat this? Well, when you look very carefully, you'll notice that there are a few subtle changes in how he lays out the story to her family compared to how the events themselves laid out. Most famously, he, will po he points out to them that he asked who she was and what house she was from before he began to give her gifts and propose a betrothal. Because, of course, only a lunatic would have just proposed to the first girl. You would have obviously wanted to check the family heritage. And this was also a way of flattering her family by trying to say that he only proposed because he knew she came from the right family, not just that she had the right spirit. Does that make him a liar? Does that mean he is deceiving them? He's changing his presentation of the events. To what end? Or we all think, uh, terrible, terrible man. <laughs> Horrible, wretched sinner. How dare you? Well, he got all the right details. He told them, however, in a way that the narrative would be more understandable, more agreeable, and, most importantly, help them make the right decision. Because what is Eliezer worried? He's worried that her family will say, no, get out of here. Rebecca cannot go back to you. I don't care how many camels you've got. I don't care how much gold you're giving as gifts. Uh, we don't want you here, and she can't go. That is clearly his fear. And so he carefully structures his story, not to um, deliberately change the facts, but to um, help them see it in a way that will be agreeable to them while still ensuring the right outcome and not doing undue uh, damage to the truth. Everybody with me so far? OK. Now, how does this work in our life? Right, this is not just a story about uh, Eliezer and, and Rivka and Isaac and Abraham. This story is told so that we can relate to it as well. Sometimes, in your personal life, do you ever have conversations where you need to um, carefully structure how you explain something to another person? Carefully uh, word a request. Carefully um, 
guide your response so that their response will become a more positive one. Have you done this before? Yeah. If sure so, is. then you are in the same company as Eliezer. On the other hand, if you uh, pride yourself as being a straight talker, I may be blunt. Don't mind me, I just don't have any tact. It's not exactly something to boast of, according to the Torah. It is fine to be diplomatic. It is fine to uh, hear the person that you are speaking with so that you may adjust and guide your language to them in a way that will be understood. Incredibly important Jewish value. And one that is very timely as well. Many of us, I am sure, have felt in the last uh, month um, put upon to enter into uh, congregate <coughs> conversations regarding the, uh, the situation in Israel. And many of us, perhaps, have been diplomatic, perhaps have not been diplomatic as the emotions have been so raw and painful. I'd like to offer a little bit of advice taken from Eliezer's uh, description. Uh, he spoke one way to Rivka because she was of a certain spirit, and he spoke a different way to her family because they were of a different spirit. And I'd like you to imagine that on, in general, there are four different types of people that you are um, likely to encounter that will need special handling during the conversation. So type number one is actually the easiest to handle. Uh, these are anti-Semites. Uh, if somebody is actually anti-Semitic, if they hate Jews and they see everything that Israel does as a, a symptom of the, uh, the Jewish control of the world, of our, our plotting to, uh, to dominate other countries, uh, our, our maniacal plotting to, uh, to, to enslave the entire world, well, great. Conversation's over. Right? There is nothing for us as individuals to do in a, in a conversation like that. Yes, we can promote invitation, uh, institutions to try and ensure that through education and interaction that such attitudes don't take root. And we should always give room for those that have held those attitudes to eventually uh, recant them and come back into the fold of humanity, um, as we do for any that are raci racist or prejudiced or, or sexist or any other type of, uh, of hate. But when it comes to trying to have a conversation, a dialogue, an exchange of ideas, we don't have to give space for those ideas to be exchanged. And so conversations with anti-Semite can be short and brief. No thank you, I don't talk to those that deal in hate. Type number two, however, is um, more complicated, which is when you are dealing with a group. And in the group, there are some that are anti-Semitic, that are full of hate, and there are others that are not. And this particular conflict in Israel, by, by I mean this particular conflict, the one in Israel that's been going on for, well, more than 100 years now, uh, is particularly ripe for this unique blend of people who want to do what is right and want to do what is good, but who associate with those that are also dealing in hate. It has uh, created a very strange uh, mixture uh, of, uh, of crowds. You can have people protesting in, in the streets together, and one may be the most um, devout pacifist, hoping for, for peace for all people, who wants nothing more than for us all to join together and, uh, and, and sing uh, in peace and harmony. And the person holding the other end of the sign in their heart wishes for all Jews to die in a bloody slaughter. And they don't quite realize who they are walking with. They don't quite understand why they are sharing this space and giving credence to the other end of that sign. But if we attack them as anti-Semites, if we say somebody who really in their heart of hearts just wants us to, to find peace, to be able to share a, a loving, just, and, and beautiful world for all people, if we call them an anti-Semite because of the company they keep, well, we're not going to convince them of anything. We're not going to help them move away from those anti-Semites that they are walking with. Because they are hearing the cry of the oppressed. They are hearing the same cry of, uh, of, uh, of those that are hurt and harmed. And they are of good spirit. And they respond as any human would to the cry of one that is injured. Whether or not that injury is truly <coughs> Israel's ultimate fault, obviously I disagree with them. But I cannot shame them for feeling sympathetic towards those that are harmed. So how do we speak to them? 
Do not perform the info dump. <coughs> do not get out your list of facts, of figures, of truths, of all of the information that proves that, in fact, Israel is the more aggrieved party than the Palestinians. None of that is going to remove from them the image of somebody that has been hurt. No amount of information will make them less sympathetic to a child that has been made an orphan or a parent that has been stripped of their child. You understand? Facts and figures are not going to melt their heart. They're not going to change their feeling that this is a painful situation. So instead, ask. Ask questions and listen to their answers. Hear what it is that they are most upset by. Hear what it is that they are most aggrieved by. And ask them how that can be then remedied. Do not allow them to simply settle into the, the, the statements of pain and of, uh, of, of frustration. Ask them where we go forward from this. And don't let them settle on the idea of free Palestine or in the occupation, because those phrases do not actually outline any policy or any direction. Ask them what that will look like. Ask them, in 20 years' time, what do you hope to see? And ask them this in front of those that are trafficking in hate. Allow them to see that their vision and those that hate are very different. That when the one who holds the other end of that sign saying, Free Palestine, says, and there will be no more Jews between the river and the sea, then the person that is a true pacifist on the other side will say, well, wait, wait, that, that's not what I'm actually looking for. I'm looking for a peaceful solution for all the people between the river and the sea. Allow them to see each other more clearly and allow them to recognize that we, we too, want there to be peace and to have a good life for all the people between the river and the sea. We only differ in how that can be pursued. We only differ in the policies that might be taken. And those policies are subject to discussion. Perhaps they have some idea of ways we can move forward. But it'll only happen if we listen to them, if we give them due credit for the feelings that they have, and show them that we too care about those things, and that we want to find a path forward. Similarly, there are some people that are simply completely uninformed. There are people that know nothing. They have no opinion one way or the other. For them, it's all in another part of the world. It's all dealing with someone else. It's too distant and complicated for them to understand. Well, like we say to the, uh, uh, among the four children, for those that do not even know how to ask a question, you open for them. You uh, guide them in some of the conversation. You give them analogies, and you give them a way to contextualize it and you give them a way to personalize it. Not by saying, what would you do if this happened to you? But explaining that their life is affected by what happens around the world. That humans in need, wherever they are, should be their concern. For the needs of humans have a tendency to spill over from country to country, from person to person, and from generation to generation. Guide them in that understanding. You do not try to uh, proselytize to them and certainly do not call them um, a terrible person because they have not yet found their place within this dialogue, but be a resource for them. Answer their questions as they begin to ask them and guide them towards more understanding. And then group number four, well, group number four may seem like the easiest group to deal with. Um, those are those that are um, pro-Israel. Israel is the bastion of the Jewish people. It is the eternal homeland and it must be defended at any cost. Great. Does that mean we don't have a conversation to have? Of course not. There is always room for a conversation within Israel itself. They daily have a conversation of what would be the best policy. What must we do next? How do we defend Israel? How do we pursue a path that will bring peace for, for Israel that will be lasting, that will be safe, that will be just, that will be fair? Those conversations need to continue. There is nothing illegitimate about asking those questions, even during times of war. Because it is only by planning for an eventual peace that the sacrifices of war will be eventually avenged by establishing a better future. We need to have those conversations with each other, with those who support Israel. And we need to be willing to disagree sometimes. That's OK. As I have said multiple times, for at least those of you that have uh, sat through my sermons before our classes, 
It is only through disagreeing that we actually come to a better understanding. There is the old joke that if you have two Jews, you get three opinions. <laughs> I don't consider that to be a joke. I consider that to be the ideal. Two people walk in, each with their own opinion. By the time they leave, they have a third new opinion. They have created something new, something better than either of them brought to the table when they first sat down. And it is that third opinion that will move us forward. So like Eliezer, recognize that we each have an obligation and an opportunity to express ourselves and our views in different ways to different people and to hear their views as well, to allow for honest, open, frank, and respectful dialogue giving no room and no, no podium to hate, but recognizing that the vast majority of the people of this world are not consumed by hate, whatever it may look like through headlines. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>